goal was to shoot it so that the the head, the eye, the bill are all sharp, which this one is. And then I just wanted it to melt away after that. Once I kind of saw how they were flying, the areas they were flying through, I was able to change my position to take advantage of it. All right, and welcome to the show. Uh, I am your host, Scott Keys, and doing something a little bit different today. We've got a photographer on with us, and we're doing a concept called 10 Images with a Guest. And our guest today is Simon Dontremont. So, Simon, say hello. How are you doing, everyone? All right. So uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to go through, and as I uh, kind of talk about Simon, I've got his website up, so I'll, I'll scroll through this as, as he introduces himself in just a minute. But we're going to take 10 images that Simon chose, and he's going to tell us a story behind each of those images or why he, he picked that image as one of his 10 favorite. Uh, there's a couple things just from a housekeeping standpoint that I just wanted to point out. One is that the show, uh, we're doing these about monthly right now, and we're going to alternate concepts. So we're going to do some topical concepts, whether it's around technical things or editing. Uh, and then we're going to alternate it with guest interviews uh, like we're doing tonight. There's a couple other sources that I have, so I'll show you up on the screen here. Uh, this is my Patreon site. It's also under Wildlife Inspired, or you can search it by S Keys Images. And you'll see um, this is a subscription site. And on this, I have a lot of extra videos that we don't put here. So these are 5, 10, 15 minute videos that I put out. A lot of teaching videos on that site. So check that out. Uh, and then I also have an alternate YouTube channel. And this is where I do uh, product reviews or software tests, things like that. So stuff that I don't want on the Wildlife Inspired channel. So I would just encourage everybody to check out uh, my, my subscription service, but also the, uh, my personal site where I do some things. You can subscribe there for free. All right, and with that said, we get the housekeeping out of the way. Let's move on to Simon. And Simon, I've got your website up now. Why don't you give us a little bit of, a, of your background? Sure, thanks, uh, Scott, and thanks for having me on. So I am uh, live in Nova Scotia. I live in a community just on the outskirts of Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia's capital up in eastern Canada. I live right on the Atlantic Ocean, and uh, I'm from here originally. I work as a senior public servant in the Nova Scotia government. But I enjoy spending my weekends and vacation time uh, trekking through the woods and along the beaches of Nova Scotia looking for interesting things to photograph. Awesome. And I, I will tell you, I found Simon, I think we actually met on Facebook when he sent me a message on Facebook about, um, about something that we were, we were debating <laughs> about a composite image. I, I kind of remember that. And, That's right, actually. Yeah, and he's like, yeah, it's definitely a composite. And I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was. <laughs> and then when he showed me the, uh, the original two photos with two different backgrounds, we both confirmed it was definitely a composite image. Uh, but that's where I met him. And then I, I went on to his Instagram site and started following him there. I was really blown away by some of the work he puts out. Um, you know, especially for somebody that's doing this like me on a part time basis and isn't their full time job. Uh, just really impressed with with what Simon does. He does a lot of uh, songbird portraits, but he's got waterfowl. He's doing some raptors, um, just a real nice portfolio. And so what we're going to do, Simon, is we're going to kick off your your 10 images here. I'm going to head over to your to uh, the Flickr page that I had set up and I've got your first image up on screen now and tell us about this one. It's a dove key. Sure, sure. This is a dove key taken in the harbor at Peggy's Cove, which folks may recognize Peggy's Cove. It has a famous lighthouse. That's a famous tourism attraction here in Nova Scotia. I guess this is an example of, uh, of uh, never thinking the conditions are never just right. This is actually a gloomy afternoon after a storm and uh, there was no light at all, uh, and uh, and the color, no color in the sky at all. And I found this little dove key uh, in the harbor, probably resting after a big storm. And uh, the water was choppy, it was windy. He did me a great favor by positioning himself in a place with a little bit of, uh, of uh, cover from the wind. But the background, the golden background is actually the back of a rusty lobster boat. So uh, I, uh, he sat there for about, I say sat there, he was diving back and forth for about 20 minutes. 
and uh, uh, another point to uh, to make for when shooting uh, waterfowl, these little floating docks that sometimes you find for smaller boats at wharves are just perfect for this type of angle. You get down on those floating docks and you're maybe six inches, ten inches above the water. And I just watched this little guy go up and down over and over and come even check me out a few times. That's awesome. So, yeah, so uh, in the middle of a gray afternoon with windy as all get out, you know, where it's hard to make a good photo in the middle of that, I just get given a great opportunity because most most photos of dove keys, they don't come close to shore very often, end up being at best some kind of ocean background yep. of just more blue water or more blue sky. So the ability for me to get a nice golden background in calm water is probably something I'll, I'll never get to get again. Yeah, and I think these are mostly seen, you know, out out on those pelagic tours that, that people go out in the ocean. So I've, you know, you hear reports about them along the shoreline, but I thought that might be why you chose this one, especially uh, just knowing that it's something you may not get a chance to see close up like this. Yes, and, and just the intimate moment, uh, uh, you know, spending 20, 25 minutes with this bird going up and down and coming to check me out, uh, it felt really good and it was lots of fun. And then I was able to leave and leave the bird there undisturbed which it should always be a goal for us in photography is yeah. to leave the bird where we found it. And a, a good reminder for people, I always think the best time of the year to do, uh, and it kind of goes back to what you said, um, the best time of year to do waterfowl photography is during fall when leaves are changing. You've got a lot of reds and oranges and yellows in the water as well as in the backgrounds. So um, exactly. Yep. exactly. I spent I spent part of yesterday shooting wood ducks with, uh, with beautiful uh, reflections and golden backgrounds. So Awesome. All right, let's get on to your next one. So this is a mallard. Now, when I saw this at first, I thought, ah, oh, you picked a mallard in flight, and that's you know that's not the most captivating image. But now I think I understand why you picked it. Yeah, this is a, this is just a, at a local duck pond. This is maybe a good example for people that you don't need a, a five or six hundred millimeter lens. I had a hundred and to four hundred lens uh, walking around at a local duck pond in Dartmouth. And uh, the uh, this mallard just flew by, but and and also a little bit of a, of, of uh, my approach to photography. It's basically I shoot as many frames as I can get at the birds. They're free, and I just my motto is keep shooting, keep shooting, shoot, shoot, shoot. And then you never know when I come back home and open my photos. It's kind of like open Christmas presents. You never know what you're going to get. And in this particular case, uh, getting the shadow of the bird on the inside right wing, I thought really added a nice uh, a nice touch to the photo. Yeah, 100% agree. If th this is one of those photos, again, that if it's just if it's just the mallard in flight, you know, it, it's a nice picture. Everything's sharp and crisp. There's good action. But it's not different. There's nothing unique about it. Now you put just that shadow and the fact that you caught the entire head in the wing and it didn't, you know, it didn't clip off the end of the bill or anything. It changes it from a really kind of average photo to almost an award-winning photo. Like that's how special those little moments can be. And like you said, it's free. So take a couple thousand or a couple hundred and uh, come home and look through. And, and this is probably not something you, you went out thinking, hey, I'm going to shoot a mallard in flight. I'm going to get the shadow on the inside wing um, and I'm going to wait for that to happen. It's just one of those things that you, you, you shoot and, you, and, and it just comes out. Yeah, exactly. And then again, this is something you can do with a hundred to four hundred lens walking at a local duck pond. Uh, the trick, as well, is to be mindful of your background. I spend a lot of if you know people ask me for for photography tips. My m number one tip is once you figure out what you're going to shoot, have a look at what the background is. So I was noticing the uh, birds, the ducks were flying from two different parts of the pond. And I positioned myself to get the golden background, the spot that I wanted, uh, and catch the birds as they were going past uh, that best part of the uh, of the background. Yep, yeah, I, I actually did the same thing recently as well. And something that uh, you know I've, I've talked about a lot, and, and Ray and I used to talk about on the show a lot was see through the bird or see through the subject. And we used to always talk about you know once you you know what the subject's going to be, the subject's not nearly as dynamic as the backgrounds, and really focusing on that. All right, let's run to this next one. Uh, these are. Ducks, it looks like you've uh, got some good action here in a very difficult shot. Uh, I know because I photographed these these same kind of scenes before. So tell me about this one. This is at Peggy's Cove again uh, in Nova Scotia, uh, close to the historic lighthouse. And uh, I'm a sucker for a good comedy shot, you know, and I, I really, uh, when I uh, can get something, I, I've got some photos, for example, of Black Gillum Gott's landing, which is actually just a glorified belly flop. 
Uh, I love catching a, something a little bit funny in the photo. So in this particular case, a uh, number of Harlequin ducks being beat around in the surf. Uh, and uh, I, I just love the, uh, the way the water uh, has overtaken that one on the right and, uh, and given it a bit of a show. And uh, sometimes it's hard to figure out how to crop these photos. Often, as you know, you're you're uh, you're cropping your photos. I think there was another uh, another uh, harlequin far on the left, which I kind of cropped out to try to get as many of the bunched up harlequins at the same time. But uh, uh, again, another example of just keep shooting, keep firing uh, the camera, and then when you get back home, you uh, you find these things. But you're not too. Uh, you, you never know where you're going to get till you get home on these. Yeah, and these are really tough. I've uh, shot these, and, and typically these ducks, as well as a few other species, they prefer oceans as, a, as opposed to inland lake, especially for wintering, at least down here. So when you're shooting these, you you really are shooting them out in surf. So whether it's from a jetty or possibly from a beach, but it, it's really, really difficult. So while we always, you know, preach low angle and get down with the at eye level, uh, a super challenge to do with, with these uh, ducks or any ducks that are out in the ocean, whether it's eiders or in this case, these harlequin ducks. Uh, the one thing I will tell you is sometimes you'll notice the bird on the right is up at the crest of that wave. And sometimes you can use those swells and crests to your advantage and try to get those um, as the duck is coming up, you'll get them a little bit more eye level. But yeah, really love that one. Yeah, all your, your tip is, is bang on. If you look at the ducks on the left, they're all riding the crest, which puts the background more uh, uh, more blurred and out of focus. So definitely a tip for, for shooting those types of birds on the waves is try to get the, uh, try to get the, get them on the crest. It makes it look like you've got a lower angle on yep, it. Exactly. All right. We've got this one now. Uh, this is a uh, Merlin, right? Yeah. looks like a Merlin. It is. It is. And this, I was proud of this photo. I kind of made a mental commitment last year. I, I'd fall. I, I felt I was getting into a rut a little bit. I was shooting bird portraits and basically, uh, you know, they're all starting to look like a bird on a stick. Well, all the photos are starting to look the same. So I made a commitment to myself when I went out to look more actively for uh, compositions where it could add more compositional elements into the photo, make the bird uh, smaller in the photo, but still have the photo have a lot of impact. That's something, Scott, I've always been impressed by your photography, shooting warblers and so on, where you've got the bird making up a small square footage on the photo but still very much highlighted and part of a really nice composition. So Thank my you. compositions, because I've got a 500 millimeter lens and shoot it often with a 1.4 teleconverter, I'm often getting in almost too tight on the birds. So really making a commitment to try to, uh, to get more compositional elements in there. So this particular case, walking along a beach, this is a lobster pot used for, for fishing lobster, an old style one. Now these days they make them out of, uh, they make them out of wire mesh, but uh, this is an older style one. But anyway, just a Merlin sitting on the beach at sunset, uh, looking around, uh, made for a really nice photo, a really nice composition and some nice light. Yeah, I love this one. And, you know, uh, there's there's some thought about man-made objects and, and when, the, when do they belong in an image and when do they not? I think this is a really great use um, of a worn, kind of disposed man-made uh, product. Uh, but the bird has now kind of taken home and, and made it its a, it, a perch. I think this, if if this was a, a a crispy, new, freshly painted piece of metal, it, it just wouldn't be the same story. This this it speaks to where you're from, right? Like this is this is your community. In old, I, I assume it's probably a lot of old fishing villages along the coast and things like that. It is exactly that. Yeah, and you're, you're right. The decision on when to increase, include man-made elements is tough. You know, a, a burned swallow on an old barbed wire looks just right and so on. But you, like you say, uh, something modern and uh, nice and new and shiny just wouldn't have the same effect. Yeah. Love that one. All right, let's get on to the next one. So here we've got, uh, this is a, a northern perula uh, perched. So tell us about this one. Yeah, Perula, warblers are, are a favorite of mine. Uh, we have a good selection of them in Nova Scotia uh, in the spring, in the fall. We have some some breeding species here in the in the uh, in the summertime as well. They're a bit of a challenge. Uh, they're they're flirty. They're quick. Uh, this is another one uh, where I recently made my commitment to include 
not just better birds, but better perches. Mm -hmm. So uh, I really like a dark background uh, to make the bird a, a really colorful bird contrast. And I really love the perch on this. There's 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 drops of dew at the end of the perches as well, mm -hmm. uh, which I find just, just mates for nice composition elements and the, and the colors. Uh, uh, just worked out really well for me. Again, moving away, the, you know, perulas on a plain branch, just like plain stick with nothing else on it. I've got dozens and dozens and dozens of those. So if I'm going to take more northern perula photos, I've got to find something more interesting uh, to put into the uh, into the photo. Yeah, and seasonally, it's going to be a little bit different for everybody in terms of that new growth. But I can remember last uh, two years ago because I was at the same point where you know you start to photograph every species, and you start to look for okay, how can I make it better? So so I started charting when the local things bloomed in the area, and what areas might have new growth, what types of trees were blossoming, and. Um, I, that's that new spring growth that you show here is really one of the best ways to capture these warblers it just it adds that that extra dimension that extra pop different colors i've been at a, on a tree um, that was a young maple and it was really really red and I, I photographed a warbler on it i came back like three weeks later and it, hit, it was all green and it just didn't look the same it didn't have the same feel to it anymore um, so spring is really a tremendous time not just because of migration but also because of the uh the blooms and the blossoms that are coming out. No, that's a great observation, Scott, as well. It's a short window in Nova Scotia here. In April, there's nothing in the trees, so there's nothing to add any character. The branches are barren. Mm -hmm. And and by May, all the leaves have sprouted, and you can't find a bird in there at all right. because there uh, there's, there's too many leaves in the way. So like you say, there's a short window, short window. of a few weeks where you've got some buds, you've got a bit of color, uh, but the thing's not all shrouded, so you can still find some birds. All right. Let's move on. I think I put two songbirds in the collection back-to-back, -back, so now we've got an uh, American Red Start. It is, and this one this one is maybe a chance to chat about not being scared of, of high ISO. This is ISO 10,000. And wow. uh, uh, on a Canon 5D Mark IV. Uh, and uh, for Canon shooters, the trick is... Uh, Canon cameras, in my experience, uh, you can't underexpose them and try to drag up the exposure after the fact. You'll just make things worse. If there's not a lot of light, you're better off shooting actually a high ISO, even overexposing it a bit and knocking it down in post-processing. But this photo, I just like for its simplicity. It's it's a bit better than bird on a stick, like I talked about, which is just the bird portrait with the, in, a, in a branch with no character. Mm -hmm. It's got a couple of other pieces that add a little bit of, of extra pizzazz and actually made the cropping. I spend a lot of time figuring out how to crop my photo. That's the first thing I look at to see whether or not a photo is a keeper is whether or not I can crop it. In this particular case, to get the intersection of the branches, to keep the the, the leaves on the left fully in the photo, mm -hmm. still something on top of the bird, the leaves on top of the bird. Uh, I just found the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the dimensions of it felt just right. And for an ISO 10,000 photo, I was pretty happy that it's uh, uh, to put it in a, in a keeper. I've never printed it, uh, but I think I could print it fairly large and it will come across uh, pretty decently. Yeah. And, I, you know, it's I did not plan this because I did not know this was shot at ISO 10,000. But I, I will put out a plug for a product that I uh, have been using and at Topaz Denoise AI. I've, I've had a couple Denoise products in the past and... I was just using the standard Photoshop noise reduction for a while, and I got a trial of that. I contacted the company. Uh, they sent me a, the full uh, version, and um, I really, really liked it. I will tell you, I, don't, I would not say that because they sent me a free product, but it was, um, it's really impressive. One of the videos I have over on my page, um, if you subscribe to my main page over here, it actually, there's a, an example. So you can actually see what Topaz Denoise um, is capable of doing. Uh, but I've had two or three images that, like you said, were high ISO and I didn't think I could do anything with them. And uh, they really they really cleaned up very, very nicely. There's some drawbacks to that. If you ever have questions about that product uh, or you're seeing anything anomalies, but there are some things you have to be careful with with that But uh, I would go ahead and, and put my endorsement on it. Tobias is also putting his endorsement on it So uh, I think and everybody I've talked to just really loves the product. Let me get over yeah. to this um, Oh, we got a so this one is really nice. So tell me about this this common loon 
Yeah, this one here is actually, I, I've really fallen in love with backlit uh, and not being afraid of backlit. So basically the sun is behind the loon and uh, loons uh, and eiders uh, have the same behavior. Around here they fish crabs and uh, for large crabs, they have a, an unusual talent of they actually rip the legs off one at a time and then swallow the body whole. Uh, for small crabs, they'll swallow the crab whole. But the behavior that they do, same thing with herons, is they flip the crab or the food or fish to get it head first several times to uh, to get uh, to get it in the right orientation before swallowing it. So if you if you're buying a camera for for wildlife photography, getting one with a high frame rate is really important. Uh, and uh, my technique is when they do the flipping, I'm just hitting the, the shutter button, uh, trying not to run down the buffer because sometimes they'll flip it five or six times. Yeah. And uh, I'll try to, to to shave my shots by firing in three or four shots at a time when they do the when they do the flipping. And then when I get home, I'm trying to find that mid flip pose uh, that was the best. So in this particular case, uh, it was this photo. Uh, I was lying low on the beach, which kind of darkened the foreground a bit. The background was darkened a bit by some trees that are in the background across this little uh, harbor that I was shooting at. And uh, I just, I, I probably, I, I believe in processing, I darkened the top and the bottom a mm -hmm. little bit just to make it a bit more, a bit more impactful. But I didn't try to crank up the saturation or try to, it was fairly backlit and the shot was quite a bit like a silhouette. So I kept that. I kept the mo the silhouette motif a little bit, uh, not worrying too much about the saturation and the color, and really liking it more. Uh, instead of black, I tried black and white, but uh, uh, this kind of soft blue uh, worked well for the photo. Yeah, there's there's a, a school of thought out there, and I, I know somebody that went on a um, a workshop with a a very famous photographer for birds, and uh, when he set up his lawn chair and told the students to put their son at their back and have a good time. You know, I thought that's really not great advice all the time. So shooting with the sun at your back is certainly gonna give you more detail, uh, but it's not gonna ever look creative. Uh, so I think you raise a good point for those people that are, you know, always thinking I have to have sun hitting the subject and the sun has to be over my shoulder. Um, you can shoot backlit. You can also shoot sidelit. So when the sun is coming from the side, it works on certain poses. It doesn't work everywhere. But, um, you know, if you were talking to portrait photographers or people that, that do that kind of work, often they're going to put the sun behind the subject so that you don't get shadows uh, across the face. So th there's definitely advantages to it. You will lose some detail. Uh, but it can create much different effects. I think the bottom line is mix it up, you know, try, try different things and you're going to find that, that, that backlit photography can really, really work. Yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, having the sun behind your back to fully illuminate your subjects is a great place to start. Mm -hmm. But uh, as you move along, like you say, side lick and bat lick, really good uh, opportunities, especially when the sun's low on the horizon, yep. uh, which which it softens it a little bit. And like you say, on, on things like foxes and so on with a bit of fur, the side lit and back lit will can, can light a rim of fur around around them, which can make for really nice effects. Yep. Um, so now this one, we're, we're on to Raptorville. So we've got a Northern Harrier here. Uh, tell me a little bit about this one. Great background separation on this one. Yeah, the background background's about a kilometer away, which yeah. doesn't hurt doesn't hurt for blowing it out. Uh, in this particular case, this was just a, a, a magical moment. Harriers and me have a love-hate relationship. Uh, I see them all the time, but trying to get a good photo of one, I find uh, very, very difficult. In this particular case, I had the sun at my back. I was sitting in my car on the side of the road. My wife was with me, actually. I had my window rolled down, and he was just coming towards me. So I pulled up my camera, and I started shooting, and he kept coming, and he kept coming. <laughs> and eventually, he passed over the hood of my car. That's great. So, and right before, you know, while he was about 30 feet away, he gave me this sideways look. Uh, which is where I caught uh, this shot. And yep. then when he flew over the car, I actually heard the whoosh of his wings, which they don't make much whoosh. They're, no. they're, the, the male is called the gray ghost for a reason because he'll pass right by you and you won't hear him. But I heard the soft whoosh of his wings as he flew right over the hood of my car. Yeah. So this was just a really cool, a big part for me of enjoying my photos is enjoying the experience yep. that I had uh, in taking them. And uh, again, for something like this, you know, 
the high frame rate, good autofocus system. Uh, it'll help keep them uh, in focus and make sure you don't miss these types of shots. Yeah, I've uh, I do I, I I attempt a lot of raptor photography in the fall with birds in flight. I will tell you if you're practicing, um, harriers are frustrating, but they offer a couple uh, competitive advantages over some of the other hawks. So number one is they fly low, so they hunt low over the marsh. I mean, they, not not a hundred percent of the time, but they give you. The chance at eye level looks where typically a red tail or, or some of the other like rough legged hawks, when they hunt, they hunt from above. So they'll start way up in the in the air or on a perch and then they'll dive down and come back up. So they don't give you nearly as many opportunities as um, these harriers. And, and another species that'll give you good looks if you can find them is a short-eared owl. So short-eared owl is hunts very similar to harriers in that they fly kind of low. They're looking in the in the grassland for, for rodents or voles or so they, they do give you these much lower looks. So for somebody that's saying, hey, I want to get do some raptor photography, I would suggest uh, start with harriers. Uh, if you can find short-eared owls, good luck, but they, they don't hunt as long during the day. They're, they pretty much hunt like sunrise, sunset, but harriers will hunt all day long. So um, it's a good species to, to start with. Yes, and here in Nova Scotia, we get harriers and short-eared owls in very similar habitats, mm -hmm. hunting over the fields, looking for mice. Yeah. So you're 100% right on that. All right, now this one's really powerful. Uh, this is a, a bald eagle and uh, in the snow, just really beautiful. Tell us about this one. No, this one, full disclosure, this is in a farmer's field where uh, the farmers throw away some some leftovers from uh, from the farming business okay. and that attracts the bald eagles. So most of my shots are taken out in uh, in, in the wild, and this is in the wild, but uh, there's, there's something out in the field for them. Uh, but I really uh, love the ability to shoot these types of birds in something like snow. Now, if someone calls me and said, let's go shoot some, uh, some bald eagles, if it's nice and sunny, it's less tempting. Yep. But we have a lot of bald eagles here in January, February, and March here in Nova Scotia. And there's a few different places around where you can, uh, where you can find them uh, uh, quite accessibly as well. So if anyone who's listening wants to, uh, to come to Nova Scotia and is looking for tips on uh, where to go, they can send me a message uh, on Instagram or on Facebook and uh, I can get back to you. Uh, this, this one, uh, I'm trying to check my shutter speed, one sixteen hundredth of a second. Interestingly enough, when they're just gliding in like this from 40 or 50 yards away, one eight hundredth of a second often will be enough shutter speed to freeze them because you know the, the shutter speed needed is relative to the distance to the target. The closer they are, the more shutter speed you need. But I like to keep my shutter speed up. Sometimes uh, bald eagles will get into a little bit of a scrap uh, over food or territory, and at that point, you need a little bit more action. But in this particular case, I just like the gracefulness of, of, of flying in, the claws out, and just the environment created by the snow for me just makes a really nice photo. Awesome. Hey, just a real quick question. Do you use back button focus? I do. Okay. I do. And I'll talk about another, a second back button, I think, in my in the in the next photo. Oh, great. Okay. Actually, I'll that give was, a back that, button that, focus led lesson. That wasn't even set up. And, and the reason I ask is with uh, Nikon, and I think it might be different with Canon, but with, with Nikon, typically you make the choice to use your thumb for either back button focus or to change um, the main dial or the shutter speed. And you can rearrange those features. I'm sure you can assign different you know different buttons to different things uh, but when i started i had uh di did not use back button focus and i found when i tried it based off of people you know swearing by it i didn't find any benefit to it but it it limited me changing my shutter speeds which which was more important to me uh, so like what you were saying if i have the choice to shoot this eagle from a distance soaring at 500th or, or 800th of a second maybe even a thousand and keep the iso a little lower on a day like today that's what i would do but as he's coming in and and like you said anticipating the scrap i'm going to then want to increase the shutter speed even if i have to sacrifice some noise and try to clean that up because at that point the action becomes more important than the clean image with less noise. So I, I always found that in a on the Nikon bodies, at least as they come out of the package from the manufacturer, um, you have to make that choice between using your thumb for one or the other. You do now. Modern Canon cameras, you can program two back buttons. Okay. And I'll, I'll mention this in the, in, the, uh, in the next photo. But before you move on, the, the, uh, the reason I went to back button focus was actually I was getting frustrated. I was, I was photographing diving turns. 
And the turns, when they would hit the water and be underwater and there was a splash of water, my focus would keep hunting, trying to find something. And by the time the, the, the uh, turn would come back out of the water, my camera had found something else to focus on. Mm -hmm. So with back button focus, I'll follow the turn down into the water or again it, or whatever I'm shooting. When he hits the water, I'll take my finger off the back button so my camera stops hunting. And when the bird pops back out of the water, I'll hit it again to reacquire focus. Yep. And, and in that way, my, my camera stops trying to refocus after the bird's under the water and uh, has a much better chance of, of reacquiring the bird when it comes back up. Yep. And I, I would tell anybody that's in that, because it's so funny you mentioned that. I was This summer, I was actually shooting with Ray, and we had a diving turn. The action was a little slow, uh, but I had this one turn, and he was diving right in front of me. And, and what you're saying is 100% true. Now, I would try to accomplish the same thing using the focus lock. So as he hit the water, I would lock focus Um with what so it's kind of like the inverse of back button focus i would lock it on the area he dropped down into and then when he popped back up i would i would hope that it was still in the same focal plane and then i would try to get him coming up did not have much luck by the way but uh that that was the attempt that can be pretty hard yeah all right let me jump on to this next one. Oh, this is the this is number 10 and i know it's number 10 because it's my favorite one so oh. <laughs> i saved it for last so tell us about this this is a ring neck duck i believe it is a ring neck duck. So again, uh, really experimenting with uh, backlit. I knew of a place where uh, these uh, ring neck ducks would be, uh, the setting sun would be setting behind them about uh, just only 15 minutes from home. And uh, I was taking photos of them in the water and then one took off, uh, not expected. And I've got, uh, Canons allow you to program two back buttons. I usually have one set for taking portraits at a lower shutter speed, lower ISO, and then I program the second one, I call it my emergency button. I basically program it one two thousandth of a second, auto ISO, uh, shot either wide open or, or 6.3, because I usually shoot a 500 f4 with a 1.4 teleconverter, so that's five, f5.6. So uh, this bird took off unexpectedly. I just basically hit my, I moved to the second back button that I've got pre-programmed for high shutter speed, center nine uh, focus points, auto ISO, and I just took this shot. And it happened, interestingly enough, when I use auto ISO with, uh, with backlighting, it actually usually exposes the, the photo correctly. I, I don't get uh, blown out highlights usually. And for this particular one for processing, I actually didn't do a lot. The water, there's some, uh, there's some open water and then there's some land about three or 400 yards behind the bird, which made for the dark foreground and the dark background. I just kind of underexposed the, the photo uh, intentionally, uh, warmed it all a little bit to get a bit more of that golden glow. And uh, of course, the uh, one of the highlights is uh, being able to see the light through the uh, through the wings uh, is one of my really favorite effects uh, when I get to shoot backlit birds, especially ducks. Uh, and of course, when you shoot many many frames per second, getting being able to to pick the pose that you like uh, after you get home. And in this particular case, the wings down and the uh, light coming through was really nice. Yeah, I this uh, I remember when I saw you post this, and I just thought this was this was a, a fantastic image. So there's a couple things that stood out to me about this one is you've got two dimensions in the water, so you've got that dark uh, tone in the foreground, and then and then the duck sits right above it, and then the duck is dark, so it's almost like the inverse. Uh, not quite a silhouette, but a dark against the light background. So you had these, if this, if the background was all that same golden color, it would still be a beautiful image, but it, for me, it just would not work nearly as well as having that dark water, um, you know, and then the lighter up top. So really, really well done. Love this image. Um, and it, and if it's okay, I'm a, I'm now going to sneak it. So this, of I, I went through your gallery. Uh, I picked out some images that I liked. Uh, this was actually probably my favorite of those. So uh, let me go through real quick. I'm just, I'm, I'll pull up, uh, right now I'm gonna pull up Simon's, um, just his, his, his Instagram. So you could see the name there at the top, uh, Simon Dantremont. Yeah, I love to say it. It's actually, Simon, the only reason I brought you on the show is so I could say your last name. You were just hoping I had an accent like uh, Brad from Newfoundland. <laughs> I, I, I honestly love having people, the problem is, for me to get the people with the real funny accents, they're like five hours ahead. And to do it live, it's normally like 2 a.m. over in um, Scotland. So 
Um, I, I decided my funny accent people are going to have to come from Nova Scotia, but I was a little disappointed because yours isn't that bad. All right, let me go through my my three. So this is uh, Simon's Instagram page is up here now. His website is also right here, and it's Simon Dontremont, all one word, dot com. And then uh, let me show you my three favorites of Simon. So uh, right now from his Instagram page, I pulled up. Uh, I think this is a pied build grebe, Simon. You probably don't see this one, but he's got a little tiny fish. It's a chick. Um, I'm not 100% sure because some of these these chicks look the same, some of these grebes. But do you remember the pick I'm talking about? Yes, yes. Yeah. I see it there on the right-hand side. You scrolled by it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a juvenile pied build uh, grebe. Oh, good. I was right. Yeah, Jason Dane, who's on the, who's who's watching us or listening to us, uh, was there with me. We were out looking for, uh, uh, we we're lo looking for green herons actually, which are a rarity in Nova Scotia. But okay. we did uh, we did find a few, and while we were checking those out, uh, this beautiful uh, little pied billed grebe and uh, his uh, one of his parents was going back and forth, and he was getting, being fed sometime by the parent, and every once in a while he was coming up with fish on his own, which was nice to see. So these juveniles, uh, pied bill grapes, have this beautiful kind of zebra pattern on them, and uh, and they have a habit of, when they dive, sometimes when they come up, they'll just poke their eyes just barely. They've got an ability to, to stay quite low in the water, and sometimes they'll just barely poke their head out of the water, and they'll just slowly come up. So in this particular case, he was just working his way up, so it made for a, a, a great photo. Yeah, I love that one. All right, let me go to my, my next favorite. This is a uh, kill deer. Now, you had two that I really liked. Uh, I would assume the lighting looked similar, so probably same day. I liked this one a little bit better because you included some of the rocks in the foreground. It had a really nice sense of uh, space. The light is is gorgeous. Again, this is kind of backlit, maybe a little back and side lit, but the, the background has a really nice glow to it. Uh, yeah, I remember seeing this one and just thought, man, that that's really, really nice. And it's a great example that, you know, not everything has to be front lit. You can see where the shadow on the rocks are being cast. So it's not 100% backlit. It's, it looks like it's a little off the side, but really well done. Yeah, thanks very much. I mean, I, I think this is also an example of not to be afraid of open space. I've, uh, I've I, I shot another version of this one where I, I left a lot more uh, open space up top. But like you say, having little bits of foliage, interesting little rocks, and not being afraid of the open space behind it. Uh, and again, that side lighting, late day, that side lighting, uh, when it's not too harsh, really adds a, a nice effect. And if you can get colorful and pretty colored backgrounds, I'll often maneuver myself. Uh, instead of trying to get closer to a bird, or, or, or an animal, I'll actually work myself quite often left or right mm -hmm. to reposition myself to get the background, the color that I want uh, as part yeah. of the photo. Yeah, we talk about that a lot, uh, just in terms of, of uh, what, you know, again, once you acquire the subject, what are you looking at? Um, I will tell you that a lot of times, once I know where the subject is, I, I almost stop thinking about that. I just try to hold my focus point. But now I start to run my eye through the viewfinder and see what what we're looking at. It's one of the reasons um, that uh, you know I've I've converted a couple tripod shooters to monopods for that reason. Because when you're carrying around a tripod, it, it does become and not for everything, but for songbirds especially and shorebirds, it becomes very hard to change the background on the fly. So the subject is dynamic, and as it moves. You know, with a tripod, you become locked in. And when you're shooting owls or eagles, you know, it might be a little bit different. You can kind of pick a spot with a good background and set up a tripod. You're probably not going to hurt you. But, um, yeah, having that ability just to adjust left or right, whether you're hand-holding or using a monopod, just, just offers some extra flexibility. Do you shoot off of a tripod all the time or most of the time? No, I'm, I'm now 80% handheld, yeah. I would say. Yeah. Uh, I used to use a, a, a tripod quite a bit. Uh, now, uh, often I will be hand holding, but I'll often try to brace myself against something. Uh, I shoot out of the car, I shoot warblers out of the car, mm -hmm. uh, same. on a bean bag, yep. uh, quite often. And the same thing with owls and fields or harriers shoot out. I use the car as a blind. It's a wonderful blind. Uh, but I use handheld, uh, most of the time, but 
if I can, I will uh, put myself down on the ground and brace myself on my knees, lean it up against a rock. I, I've got that neoprene cover on my lens, but it's not for camouflage. It's actually yeah. uh, so I don't damage my lens because I'm always leaning it on a rock or, uh, or, yeah. or a log or a tree or something. Yep. To I try to get, just to get the best stability I can. I hear you. All right, let's go to the last image. Um, and this is a, a really simple subject. So here's a great example of taking a subject that a lot of people, you know, when I'm out shooting uh, and there's sparrows around, the, the song sparrow pops up and I avoid it. And then, you know, I'm looking for like the Lincoln sparrow or the Vesper sparrow or the, you know, the rare migrant that's coming through this area. And the song sparrows are over there and I'm not even paying any attention. So, but here's a great example of how composition just makes an image. And you've got, again, this is light coming uh, off the off the backside, but really you've got this sense of repetition, uh, which in art you can you can create. So an artist can paint this repetition. A photographer really has to work and maybe a little luck is involved as well to get this sort of repetition where you have two birds, one in focus, one out of focus. Lighting's great. Uh, but they almost mimic each other in terms of pose. And uh, I really, really loved this one from the time I saw it. Oh, thanks, Scott. This was one of my, uh, I've made a few, a few, uh, a few uh, models for myself or a few uh, goals for the year. Number one was to uh, do, do better than bird on a stick and try to find some opportunities for the birds to be small in the frame and have some good good composition. My other goal I gave myself was to take uh, uh, exceptional photos of unexceptional birds. Mm -hmm. uh, often when you're out in the field, you're going to see chickadees and song sparrows and robins. And I gave myself a challenge this year to say, if I have an opportunity to make some really great photos with just those you know, very average birds, then then it'll kind of raise my game uh, when I do get some, some exceptional birds. So like you say, repeating patterns, uh, good light, uh, these are all things that uh, that uh, improve your photography. I actually picked up a couple of years ago landscape photography, and one of my main goals in, in picking up landscape photography was actually to improve my skills in composition, understanding light, uh, and a lot of the things that goes into a landscape photo mm -hmm. to try to be able to incorporate those into my wildlife photography. And I think it's helped because yep. it, it, in landscape photography, you spend more time thinking about the, your composition and your compositional elements and where the light is coming from. And being able to add that to my bird photography, I think, has helped a lot. Yeah, I'm going to pull up just so people uh, let me just change the screen here. But just so people understand that it's not just birds that you do. I've got your uh, website open now with some nightscapes. You actually said, you know, as we were talking previously, when you get requests, requests for uh, prints, you actually get more requests for these nightscapes and some of your landscape work than you do for your uh, wildlife work. I do. I do. I mean, people will love an owl, a fox or those uh, that uh, that bald eagle in the snow. Uh, but the reality is uh Landscape photos of famous landmarks in Nova Scotia or lately my project has been uh, taking uh, Milky Way photos over over landscapes and in, in uh, or or, uh, or things in Nova Scotia that are well known. For example, you see there a balancing rock. I've got up in the upper left hand corner uh, is a Milky, a Milky Way behind balancing rock, which is a famous uh, tourism uh, uh, site in yep. uh, in Nova Scotia. So, now, yeah, yeah, those. Those people really like those, and uh, they're a lot of work, though. They'll I'll end up with a sleep disorder after a while. <laughs> but my son comes with me quite a bit to uh, to shoot those as well. My son uh, is Rene uh, D'Entremont, and he's got a great Instagram page uh, and uh, is a great photographer in his own right. So we uh, it's family time as well sometimes when we're out tramping around in the middle of the night. Yeah, really great stuff. Let me just check real quick. I'm going to look over at the comments and see if any questions came in before we uh, wrap up the show. Uh, any questions, if anybody has anything, go ahead and type those in the chat box. Uh, while you do that, I, I forgot to mention that, um, you know, I we run this on a budget. So I'm running this out of my base room. I told Simon this is not a high budget production. I'm lucky if I get through the whole show without any interruptions. And, and to that point, um, I had to show everybody this. So uh, this is my new dog <laughs> who I was afraid was going to interrupt the show. Uh, she likes to bark. So this is, her full name is Amina, but we call her Mina. 
So fortunately, Mina was a good girl tonight and you did not hear her. Uh, but if you know anything about me, I love birds and I love dogs. So uh, this is my, my Tilly girl. This is Miss Tilly in the snow that I took uh, over the winter. And then I took this one. Um, I take Jacks up to the Hawk Watts a couple times a year. He's getting a little older, but he still makes it up on the rocks real good. And he loves going up. Uh, so I, I took my my camera and got a picture of him up with me this year. So that's my that's Ajax. We call him Jack. So Jax, Amina, and Tilly Girl. So those are my dogs. And let me see if any other – I didn't see any comments come through. So Simon, great show. Uh, loved having you. Thanks for being my first guest to test this concept. I think it went over really well. For the people uh, watching, feel free to either, most of you follow on Instagram, so send me a message on Instagram about the uh, content of the show and if you like the format, any suggestions you have in the future. I will tell you what we have coming up, a couple things. Um, this is my busy time of year, November and December, so we will be a little bit light on content. I'm going to do one more of these uh, 10 images with and then in January, I'm going to do one between November and December. Uh, I have a couple guests line up. And then in January, I'm going to do one that I've, I've had conceptually for a while. I'm going to do at least two parts. It could even be three. I've already got somebody lined up to help me with that. But this is going to be on composition. And we're going to talk about um, some of the basic rules of composition. And then we're going to do another show on creative composition. And then we're going to probably wrap that up with a critique show that, that encourages people to submit images. And that'll be for Patreon members. So they'll submit images uh, to me. I'll curate those, pick out a few, and then I'll have another guest on to do a critique uh, featuring composition. So that'll kind of be the, the, the highlight of the show. Uh, hoping to get Tracy Sepkovic on for that. So she's already made a commitment. I'm putting this out there publicly, so she has to follow through on it. And with that said, if there's no more questions, I'm going to wrap this one up. Simon, thanks again for joining. Uh, I thought we had a great show. Hey, it was lots of fun, Scott. Thanks for having me on. All right. All right, guys. Thanks for watching and have a great night.